Hello and welcome to Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. I'm Father Charles Connor, a member of the seminary faculty, and I have today the very, very great pleasure and the great honor to interview His Excellency Archbishop Harry Flynn. Archbishop Flynn was an alumnus of this sem is an alumnus of this seminary. I'm not quite sure to be put in the past tense. You are an alumnus That's of this right. seminary. And you uh, were a former rector of this seminary, and now we'll say you are the Archbishop Emeritus of St. Paul, Minneapolis, in Minnesota. So welcome, Your Excellency, and we're more than honored that you uh, would give us this interview today on a very, very important topic. And uh, I, I want to begin, if I may, with a quote from a priest who was serving as vocation director in the diocese or I may have even been an archdiocese in those days, of Oklahoma City, Tulsa, when it was all one, back in 1959. And this vocation director wrote to Monsignor Mulcahy here at the Mount. He said, we appreciate very much your having a look at Stanley. We hope he will not disappoint you. So we're certainly talking about someone who did not disappoint anything but disappoint. We're talking about a man who was so very shortly to be beatified, the first graduate of uh, any American seminary uh, to be uh, given the title of blessed, to be beatified. And so I'd like to begin, Your Excellency, because you have such knowledge of him. We want to begin a little bit with <coughs> Stanley Rother and his background. He, of course, came here in 1959 to the seminary and was ordained to the priesthood in 1963. When Stanley Rother arrived here from Illinois, uh, Archbishop Harry Flynn was, I believe, a deacon at that time. Were you not? Or... I was in third theology. Third, so a little before your deacon. Yes. So you would have been two classes ahead of That's him. That's right. Now, <clears throat> he, of course, was an Oklahoma boy, born and raised. Uh, he was of German descent on both sides of his family. And I get the impression that the, the family had been in Oklahoma for some generations by the time Stanley was born in 1935. Do you think that's pretty accurate? Or? I think it is somewhat <clears throat> accurate. However, I believe that when his grandparents came from Germany, they settled, interestingly enough, in Minnesota, in the mm -hmm. Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, in New Trier, where the grandparents are buried uh, in the parish cemetery. In Minnesota? In Minnesota. I see. So who would have come into Oklahoma? Uh, either his father or grandfather uh -huh. uh, would have migrated then to Oklahoma, mm -hmm. uh, where they were farmers and mm -hmm. very, very um, uh, uh, successful farmers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when Stanley came to the seminary, as you might bring out uh, in our conversation, he came from another seminary which did yes. not think he had the Ac uh, academic background to become a priest. Oh, it's much part of the story, indeed. Uh, I, I think before we get there, though, Archbishop, uh, how about his family, if we could speak about them in Oklahoma? Now, you, I, I gather you knew them to some degree. No, I did not. I never did... met his family. We didn't travel quite as much in those days as they do now. But you, you never met them here? If no. Of course, they may not have traveled here. And they did not travel and... here. I knew that he had a sister, has a sister, who's a precious blood sister. Yes. Uh -huh. And we had precious blood sisters study here during my tenure as rector mm -hmm. of the Columbia province. And they I came see. here to study ascetical theology and scripture. Ah, oh, very good. And there were two brothers, I believe, also, the, in addition to the family. Now that, I... But you, you've, not, you've never personally met any of the family members over the years? I have not met any of or, the family. I see. Okay. So really, your, your first introduction to him then uh, was when he came here as a seminary. And as you, as you bring out, of course, its, uh, uh, its uh, studies were very, very hard. There, there was a memo, somewhat confidential in those days, but certainly open to historians today, uh, a confidential memo or report from his pastor. And uh, the pastor of the parish where he was from wrote, uh, it's difficult for Stanley to learn that he is an excellent and moral boy. He seemed, therefore, to, to sum him up pretty well, I think. Uh, and yet, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the rectors uh, uh, in Oklahoma wrote to, uh, again, to Monsignor Mulcahy here, no foundation in Latin seems to be uh, the main trouble. Uh, and and uh, he needs 
a lot of beefing up, apparently, in Latin. The fact is, however, his, you know, his academic record was really, I mean, he, he failed the philosophy, failed theology, and yet then he was, he was accepted here at the Mount. Something obviously happened to him here at the Mount because there are any number of letters from Monsignor Mulcahy about the wonderful academic progress that he made from the time he arrived here and how edifying he was and how essentially how <coughs> good he was doing, you know, in his, in his uh, studies here at the Mount. Something I think Archbishop must have happened in him, don't you think? It probably <coughs> did. And, um, and that does not surprise me because Cardinal Sheehan once referred to the seminary and, and of the Mount St. Mary's and the Daughters of Charity in Emmitsburg, once referred to the area as Blessed Emmitsburg. Mm -hmm. And blessed things can happen mm -hmm. to people at the Mount. If you recall, um, a graduate of the college was Father James Walsh, uh, later to become Bishop Walsh. I was going to get to him later, too. Cumberland, yes, Maryland. Yes. And um, he, he had been in prison in China in solitary confinement mm -hmm. for many years, a graduate of our college. Mm -hmm. and, um, Did you know him? I did, mm -hmm. indeed. Uh, there's, a, there's a contrast here, isn't there? Bishop Walsh was a dry martyr. In many, yes. many ways, he was a yes. dry martyr, you know, of all the years of persecution he had to endure in China. And Father Stanley, of course, was, uh, uh, what shall we call him by contrast? I, I don't want to say a real martyr, because dry martyrdom is martyrdom as well. Yes. But th they were both martyrs, were they They were not? both and martyrs. Th uh, quite a tie-in. And I, may I refer to Bishop Walsh for a moment or two? Yeah, absolutely. You were, you were just coming back from his funeral. Uh, you had you're just gotten back from it, and you had written to Monsignor McGinnis a little note saying, I've just returned from the funeral of Bishop Walsh, and I'm enclosing in, with this letter uh, a notice about Father Rother's death uh, in, in Guatemala. Yes. Um, Bishop Walsh, as you know, graduated from the college. Mm -hmm. He did not graduate from the seminary. And he uh, went to New York City and worked one year in, in an insurance company. And then the Mary Knoll order was just beginning. And um, so he went up the Hudson River and joined the Mary Knoll Fathers, mm -hmm. was ordained a priest and sent to uh, China, where he built hospitals, churches, and then became a bishop and served the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. When the country became communist, communistic, James Walsh was arrested and um, put into solitary confinement with nothing to read and uh, sitting there day in and day out. And he was permitted one hour of exercise in the courtyard every day with a, uh, a guard, but not permitted to speak to the guard. On the occasion of his golden jubilee, his brother, Judge Walsh from Cumberland, Maryland, went into China and we sent him a golden rosary. He was not permitted to have it. Interestingly enough, that golden rosary was given to him upon his release. And when he was released, he came back to the mouth. He wanted to say his rosary one more time at the grotto before he would meet the Lord. And I can recall the evening vividly. There was a great gathering of alumni down in the dining room, and a great dinner, and they were waiting for him to make a speech. And um, the place was packed and packed with media. And he stood up to make the speech wearing that little gray sweater that he was so wont to wear on so many occasions. And he looked out at the crowd and he said, I love the Chinese people. Then he said that again, I love the Chinese people, and I would go back to them again tomorrow if only they would have me. And then he said for the third time, I love the Chinese people, and he sat down, and that was his speech. Now you asked me, did the Mount do something uh, for people like James Walsh and Stanley Rother? Mm -hmm. And I think it did. And we go back to the 50th anniversary of Mount St. Mary's in 1858, mm -hmm. and Father McCaffrey was the president at the time, and he gave this great speech to bishops from all over the country, from, to educators, and he asked, why is it that this place has succeeded? 
when it's not sponsored by a religious order or nor sponsored by any particular diocese, even though it is within the wonderful primatial see of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. And he concluded that it succeeded because the hand of God is on this holy mountain. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe we have people like Stanley Rother, uh, James Walsh, and a host of others who have contributed as laymen and laywomen and as clerics in our country and beyond. Something happens when one comes to Mount St. Mary's. And in connection with that, uh, we can say something about Father Rother's uh, spiritual life that directly ties in, I think, to what you're, what you're saying there. There was a, an observation made of him by one of the rectors in Oklahoma, at the minor seminary there, uh, saying that he was a very good man, he was a very, very solid man, came to chapel often, not, not overly pious was the expression used. Now, by contrast, we have here one of your personal recollections of him as a seminarian, and you make a statement in there saying, I envied him, his relationship with God, because whenever he came into the chapel, he seemed to be lost in that relationship. Now, that, that I think, would directly tie in. There, there may well have been some kind of a transformation that came over this young man any time after 19, and his spiritual life, <clears throat> any time after 1959. That could well have been. I would also agree with the other observation that he was not pietistic. Mm -hmm. um, he would be downstairs, we'd be laughing, having great times in recreation, and then he would come upstairs into the chapel and seem to, to me to have been transported to God immediately. Mm -hmm. I envied the way he prayed mm -hmm. because I was more distracted than a Stanley Rother was. And I think the fruit of that prayer brought him to that moment of martyrdom in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How about the episode that occurred when he was a seminarian here and he was all covered with the bees, you know, and you remember that one? I do. Uh, it was I, at the grotto. I it was at the yeah. grotto. He <clears throat> loved the grotto and spent every afternoon in, of, of recreation working up at the grotto. He wanted to make sure it was as beautiful as possible and spent energy um, that working up there which would later come to a certain fruition about which I'll tell you in a few moments. Okay. So he, um, he was obviously a man while he was here who was, as I say, a man who had an academic transformation, a man who may very well have had a spiritual uh, transformation, and yet a man who was extremely down to earth. We have a testimony from one, uh, one of his former classmates uh, who uh, uh, invited him home with him over a holiday vacation where he could not get back to Oklahoma, and uh, how tremendously impressed this young man's parents were uh, with Stanley Rother and thinking, you know, what a great, great priest he would make. But, uh, you know, the, the, the academic difficulties <clears throat> he had, there are two things that strike me about it. First of all, he's, he's reminiscent of the Curie of Ars, who had great academic difficulties. But secondly, would he not have something to say today? to seminarians in general, in particular to, to our own seminarians here at the Mount, who find themselves in this same kind of a situation where learning is difficult, where it's a problem, and so forth. Does he I, not have something to say to today's seminarian? I would <clears throat> say that Stanley Rother would have something to say to seminarians of any generation. He would have plenty to say to the seminarians today who very easily get discouraged because of one thing or another. Mm -hmm. But Stanley, had that academic challenge. But God helped him enormously because this man who had a challenge with Latin, which was so necessary at the time, and later really uh, was not as necessary as it was during his tenure as a seminarian, this same man was able to take the New Testament and translate it into a very, very difficult Indian dialect. Uh -huh. And he sent me a copy of this, which that copy, I hope, is now in the archives because I sent it to the archives when he had sent that to me. And so we can see the hand of God in his life and the hand of God in his journey, and we can certainly 
see the hand of God on this holy mountain, mm -hmm. as McCaffrey um, once stated. Absolutely. He uh, was ordained a priest in 1963 from here and served for about five years in Oklahoma in various parish assignments. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, he finished here in 63. Now, if you look back at that period of time, the Vatican Council was just getting uh, somewhat underway and began in 62, ended in 65. So, so his seminary years would not necessarily have been affected uh, as much as his early priestly years. But I, I'm wondering, uh, a great fascination about uh, Stanley would be this. Where would you place him theologically? I mean, was he, was he taken up with the, the revolutionary theology, shall we call it, or was he taken up with any of the misinterpretations of the council? Or do you think he maintained a, a very great solidity about him, we'll call it that? <clears throat> I would say that Stanley <clears throat> was as solid as they came. Mm -hmm. um, he could be in the midst of any kind of a storm, theological or otherwise, and just keep sailing ahead, keeping his eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the one about whom all of us should be uh, concerned, mm -hmm. and, um, and not paying too much attention to the storm around him. And he went down there to Guatemala, and he knew what his mission was. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, when he went to that parish, it has been said that very few people were practicing their faith. That's right. Mm -hmm. But because of his simplicity and his loving care for those good people, all of a sudden that began to change and people began to come to Mass and people began to um, worship God once again because they saw in their midst a shepherd after the heart of Christ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, he spent his time there doing that. And there's a tremendous and an enormous love for him by those good yes, people. Indeed. And that came alive. And uh, that brings to mind also uh, something that he wrote in uh, one of the letters that he sent you from Guatemala about the, literally the hundreds of baptisms he was performing. Yes. Much of that obviously came from his own priestly spirit, didn't it? Yes, because he was such a servant of the people. Uh, Stanley had the heart of a servant. It was what the priesthood should be about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we were more successful on that on some days than others, as we all know. Sure. But he had the heart <laughs> of a servant, and that heart of the servant was alive every single day in that man. And uh, in, in line with, with uh, his theology, another uh, kind of significant point I think that comes to mind is, um, and it, it uh, is reminiscent of what one of the priests who was a, a friend of his here at the seminary said about him, uh, kind of in recollection. Uh, he said, Stanley did not have a political bone in his body. In other words, he was not necessarily attracted to, uh, to matters political. Now, when you go to Guatemala, there are plenty of matters political, and it would be swerving around him all the time. Uh, and also theological, for that matter, because you have loads of liberation theology, because you had all these leftist guerrillas and so forth who were the ones who were, going to, who were being incited and obviously were uh, going to go all the way, so to speak, in our story here. Uh, but uh, was he in any way, shape, or form, to your knowledge, affected by that liberation theology? There, there was a priest, a native Guatemalan, who uh, was serving with him for a given period of time there, and he uh, has a uh, reminiscence, you know, Father Lothar, in, uh, in, in writing. And you can, you can tell it's somewhat difficult for the man to write in English, obviously, being native of Guatemala. But nonetheless, he, he expressed his points very well and very clearly. And he said that he personally, this, this other priest, was quite attracted to liberation theology, would get, up and, would get up and preach some of the tenets of it to the people there. And I'm wondering, did any of this, to your knowledge, wear off on Father Rother? Not to my knowledge. <clears throat> or, or to, what, to, what, to what extent would he have an attraction, or if any, to liberation theology? Uh, I think he observed very closely what was happening to, him, uh, to the people in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And I think he was affected by that. I don't, uh, I don't know whether Stanley would have been attracted to any type of theology at all except to make the name of Jesus Christ known and loved. And that's all the aspects of the Lord Jesus, the justice aspect and everything about the Lord. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make that name known and loved. And in 1978, 
he called me from Guatemala. And he asked if he could come back to the Mount mm -hmm. and spend a week. Right. And I met him at Dulles Airport. Mm -hmm. And immediately, when he got off the plane, I met him right at the gate. And he got off the plane, and he began to tell me immediately what his concerns were. He said, terrible things are happening to the Indian people in Guatemala. If they would ask for just a few cents more for picking coffee beans, a truck would come into the village that night, stop at the home of the one who was asking for a little more money, and then that person would be taken out to the country, tortured and killed, and the body thrown into a well to poison the well. Mm -hmm. In other words, to give an example to the others not to be asking for more money. And uh, he told me this in, in horror, and he said, if I speak, they're going to kill me, but if I keep quiet, what kind of a pastor will I be? Stanley spent a week here at the Mount, mm -hmm. and I would see him for meals, but then during the day he would be in the seminary chapel praying, he would be in the garden making the Stations of the Cross, and then he would climb the mountain to his beloved grotto where he had that experience with the bees and everything else mm -hmm. and which he loved so dearly. And at the end of the week, he said, I know what I must do. I must speak. His archbishop at the time wrote to him and he said, don't you think it would be wise for you to come back to Oklahoma City because you're on a hit list? And Stanley wrote back and said, the shepherd cannot run at the first sign of danger. Pray for me that I might be a sign of the coming of Christ for these good people. And at the end of the week here, he said to me personally, I know what I must do. I need to go back and I need to speak. Mm -hmm. But he also told me something else. He said, they will never take me out and shoot me in the country and leave my body or throw my body in a well. He said, I will put up a fight. And he was as strong as strong could be. And then I was sitting back in Albany in 1979 and I, or 1980 at that time, I believe. And I read in the Times, Albany Times Union that he had been killed in Guatemala. And I can remember those words that that he spoke to me before he left, and I knew it would be the last time I would see Stanley or visit with him, that uh, he would not permit them to take him out and kill him somewhere, but that he would put up a fight in the rectory. And then I went down there after his death. The Indian people loved him so <clears throat> very, very much that they would not let anyone touch his body until they had his heart. And Father Greg Schaefer, a priest of New Ulm, Minnesota, who was in the mission on the other side of Lake Atillon, told me himself that when he got over to Stanley's mission, the Indian people had surrounded the rectory and again would not let anyone touch the body until they had his heart. And Mr. Rother back in Oklahoma didn't want them to do that. And yet Father Greg Schaefer told me himself that he talked to Mr. Rother on the phone and said, you've got to let them do this because your son was so loved by these people and it would mean so much to them. And finally, Mr. Rother, according to Father Schaefer, acquiesced. And I went down to Guatemala and brought his body, or his, excuse me, his heart to its final resting place in the church. And I will always remember the intense love that those people had for this great priest and this great man. Uh, intense love, and um, and I sat in the room was he, where he was martyred and looked up at the wall and saw his blood spattered all over the wall, and I could not help but think, how could anyone have done this to this gentle, gentle, faith-filled priest who came only to serve God's people and came only to make the name of Jesus Christ known and loved? But so many times, as we all know, the, the theology of justice is very hard for some, some people, for some, for some Christians to take. Mm 
because if they perceive that it's going to take something from them, they don't want any part of it. So it's something that we, that is a mystery. People accept Christianity, but many times they will not accept certain parts of Christianity. And I think this was part of the, um, the mystery in Stanley's death. Without a doubt, the people who killed him were all baptized Catholics, without a doubt. Sure. And yet, that part of the gospel never reached them. And it's so important that we have a person like this raised up now by the church for beatification and hopefully for canonization, who lived that gospel, not politically, but lived it with all the gospel ramifications that would take place after, mm -hmm. after he lived it. And that, one of the gospel ramifications was his own martyrdom. His own martyrdom. So I think we can say then, uh, without too much uh, doubt at all, uh, that it was right on this holy mountain that, that he made his decision to return to Guatemala. It was. It was, it was here. We are in the midst of and I remember the moment, a man making his decision for martyrdom. That's right. Say, right? I, I remembered exactly the words that he spoke to me. If I go back and speak, they'll kill me. But if I keep silent, what kind of a shepherd would I be? Do you, do you know some of the things that he may have said when he went back? Uh, no, no. Uh, he, he wrote thank you notes, but they were... Uh, no, but I mean, what, what he would have been saying publicly in Guatemala oh, I, that caused no, the... I do not know, except that uh, in, in general ways, when he was here, he said, I must speak about the injustices mm -hmm. being perpetrated against these people. To ask for a, a few more pennies for picking coffee beans and saying this is all right is not anything exorbitant that they are asking, nor is it any uh, e extremely dramatic for mm -hmm. a pastor to come out and say, well, this is all right, yeah. even though it will uh, be a less profit for the ones who own these plantations. Archbishop, how much time elapsed between the event of his martyrdom and, and your being down there and seeing what you saw? You say you brought the heart? <laughs> You, yes. you brought his heart from Oklahoma. No, no, no. His heart was already there. Oh, it had never. Uh, oh, I was thinking it had been. No, it was there. In but they had the Indian people had a place in the church where they wanted it placed, for in a permanent place, mm -hmm. and that's when I uh, brought. I went down and brought that heart to its permanent resting place, and. Where, where was it actually when you first? It was heart. somewhere else in the church. I see. Uh, and you moved it to what that's would be. That's right. Was this done within some liturgical oh, context? Oh, yes. Or? It was a but. great ceremony, and the people filled the church uh -huh. to capacity. <clears throat> and I'll always remember, because there was one scene down there where the paramilitary people came into the village when some of the villagers were asking for a little more money and they called them out of the fields, the coffee bean fields, and mm -hmm. as they emerged, they killed them all. They killed all the people at once, and there were statues of those people who had been killed. Some were very, very young, mm -hmm. uh, teenagers, and a group of people gathered uh, around to meet me, and all of whom uh, had someone in their families killed because they were asking for justice. And there was one boy, he was about 11 or 12 years of age, who was completely deaf, who carved out for me a carving of St. Paul with the most intricate um, design that you could imagine, writing his letters, and gave it to me because I was the Archbishop of St. Paul at the time, gave it to me as a token of appreciation and gratitude for my relationship with Stanley Rother and for me to take back to St. Paul, and I have that in my home today. But of all those people, uh, Father Greg Schaefer was there at the time from the other mission, and he mm -hmm. told me every one of those people had people killed in their own families mm -hmm. because they asked for a lit little more. It was an interesting time in the church in South and Central America. You remember the wonderful women, uh, sisters and that lay woman in El Salvador, mm -hmm. who were killed on their way to the airport. And our government, the United States government, which I love, mm 
but would not uh, call the martyrs. They said they were politically associated. Mm -hmm. And Eda Ford was the Mar one of the Marion Old sisters who was killed that day. And when her mother, an Irish-born woman, um, heard that our government said they were politically associated, she answered and said, politically associated my foot. When my daughter went down there, she taught people to say the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven. And everyone said, Grand, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Everyone said, Grand. But when my daughter taught them to say, give us this day our daily bread, that's when they killed my daughter, Ida Ford. So uh, <clears throat> there was a rejection of the gospel of justice and it's a good thing to remind everyone when we accept the gospel, we accept um, the care of brother and mm -hmm. sister, we accept that care mm -hmm. and Stanley did it in a dramatic way mm -hmm. so that yeah. the rest of us can look upon, it, upon him and see our own obligations to care for those who are poor. Very much so. And again, uh, how, how much time did you say elapsed between his martyrdom and your travels there? Uh, it, it was a good number of years. I was named Bishop of Lafayette in 86, and then uh, Auxiliary in St. Paul, Minneapolis in 94, so I went down after I was named Archbishop in, in uh in St. Paul, Minneapolis. So it would be in the 90s and you, the were, 90s, you were yes. there. And, and prior prior to your visit, you know, the, the uh, Father Rotha's heart was in one part of the church. That That's had been, right. That had been removed, and his body had been brought back to his native... Oklahoma. Uh, turf where Oklahoma. now I understand <clears throat> it will be in a chapel at the cathedral. I see. Very good. At, through the years, Archbishop, did, did you have... You, you mentioned you had not... Uh, met his family personally, but did you have any correspondence with his mother or father or his sister? Or I don't believe that I did. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that I did. His present, uh, <coughs> the present Archbishop of Oklahoma City is a graduate also of this seminary. Yes. And um, he was the one who told me about the chapel in the cathedral. I see. Uh -huh. Very good. And uh, was it um, uh, your, your initial trip to Guatemala, was this at your own initiative? It was, and we had um, we had uh, Father Greg Schaefer was down there, mm -hmm. and he was from Minnesota, but not from the archdiocese. He was from the diocese in New Ulm, mm -hmm. and so um, uh, I can't remember if he invited me or one of our priests who had been a missionary in Venezuela invited me to go, and th that he would go with me, and he accompanied me. And how long did you stay? Yeah. I was there about a week. I see, very good. Yes. And prim primarily around the same area where he had been. Yes, or had I was at, at the mission of Father Greg Schaefer, and we stayed there stayed across there. the lake. Well, to come back again, I'd like to return just for a moment now to this uh, to this retreat, this private retreat, we'll have to call it, that that uh, Father Rother made here, uh, in which he made his decision to to return to uh, to Guatemala <clears> again. <throat> Uh, it, there, it was a certain discernment, obviously, that came to him on, on Mary's Mountain. Uh, and I, I wonder, again, if we might tie into uh, a question that we spoke about a little bit earlier. Uh, while he is certainly an example for today's seminarians who may be struggling academically, might he not also be an example in the various areas of discernment that all of these young men have uh, here in the same seminary where he studied? Uh, would he not be an intercessor in that regard for these these young men today. I believe that he would, and I believe that the lesson he would teach them, uh, as he taught the world through his own ministry, is that, is that we are ordained not for ourselves. We are ordained for God's people. Mm -hmm. And we become the servants of God's people, and, and we are not ordained to be a a class all by ourselves because the very purpose of the foundation of this seminary on a college campus, at that time all men, but now a co-ed campus, the very purpose is to be educated alongside women and men who are being trained for other professions. And we in this venerable seminary, which I love, 
uh, are being trained to serve the God's people and serve them generously and um, without any thought of any uh, overly inconvenience to ourselves. Sure. So in your own seminary days here, uh, you, were just, you were just beginning third theology when Father Rother came here. Yes. So you, you, you would have been two years together here as seminarians. And we became very close friends. And, uh, uh, and from that friendship, w would you have particular memories of, or in of particular incidents that might have occurred in your <clears throat> seminary days that come back to you? My memory is only of a solid, prayerful, joyful person mm -hmm. who would help you in any way that he could. Mm -hmm. That's my memory. And it's a very positive one. And I might say, too, that Father Stanley Rother was at my first Mass which was celebrated in Schenectady, New York. I don't know how that was arranged, but my memory tells me that he was there and uh, recall that. And some years went by, uh, uh, I, I would think they would be initially after his ordination, that you did not necessarily have the contact with him that you did in seminary days. It resumed more in his Guatemala years, would you would say? It, yes, he would send me various <clears throat> gifts. He would send me stoles. And I think... Do you still have any of them? I do not. No. I left them here when I came. I sent most of them to the archives at that time. I see. Yeah. And, um, and little notes which I did not keep. I didn't see any reason to keep them. There would be personal notes of what was happening. Sure. But never went into great detail about the poli poli political situation in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Just how he was doing. But we kept in contact and I would write back. Mm -hmm. and, um, but those little things, uh, there were little carvings, too, that mm -hmm. he sent me that I believe are in the archives. I left them here. Uh, one, one aspect to uh, Your Excellency of his spiritual life, which, which we have not touched on, but yet in, in our own collection of uh, reminiscences, uh, there are a number of points brought up that he did have uh, an unusually strong devotion to Our Lady. Uh, obviously, obviously, he worked at the Grotto and so forth. Yes. Uh, were there any particulars of his devotion that that stay in your mind at all? Um, I can see him. That was more of an interior uh, thing, of course. So perhaps yes. not. But as we speak, I can see him in the chapel uh, saying his rosary. Um, I can see, and I can remember, I was sitting down when I was saying mine, and he was kneeling. Uh, and I can picture him to this day. And in those days in the chapel, we had choir stalls that we faced each other. And in St. So, Bernard's, you mean? In St. Bernard's oh, Chapel. Yeah. And uh, that was changed sometime after I became a priest. Mm -hmm. In my deacon year, excuse me. And it was very distracting because you were looking across, instead of looking up at the tabernacle, and to look at the tabernacle, one would have to look like this. So it was a bit distracting, and I have nothing against choir uh, <laughs> prayer, but uh, uh, but it uh, but I, I could not help but be distracted and look and see him saying his rosary. I was very impressed with that. Do you remember the particular day or what you were doing uh, when you read about his death? Or do you remember the particular emotion that came over you when you first heard or read about his death? I was sitting in the downstairs dining room of the Chancery Office in Albany, New York, mm -hmm. and I read in the Times Union of his death, and I was angry. I was so angry, uh, and I had that same ang was anger. That and I, I had that same anger when I sat in the room in which I looked at the, his blood on the wall, and I could not help but wonder how could anyone have done this to yeah. such a good person. Not that you would do such a thing to a bad person, but Stanley stood out so so well in my mind as a man of great integrity, uh, great purpose, and uh, and so filled with God, mm -hmm. so be beautifully filled with God that I was angry that's angry that someone would try to destroy that. Very very interesting. Very interesting to hear that. I'm wondering too what we can learn from his life and his death, and most particularly what seminarians here, we've touched on a lot of it, but uh, there has to be perhaps an overall message, uh, particularly for our own men here at the Mount. 
Well, I think Maybe it is the message of service that you talked about yeah. earlier. Are any other things that might hit I you at Just all? one overall, <clears throat> and it's from the gospel. God's ways are not our ways. Mm -hmm. And we need to find God's ways a little more. Mm -hmm. And God is not particularly found in a committee meeting, although they're very helpful at times. But we need to look beyond that and and delve into the very life of God in our prayer in order to, to discern what God is calling each one of us to do. Very, very wonderful thought for, for all of us, seminary and faculty and everyone else. You are now, Your Excellency, in a somewhat uh, uh, rare group of human beings, uh, and I mean by that that you are a man who lived with one of the Beati, a, a blessed, who uh, almost certainly, please God, will be a saint someday. Uh, you, you lived with him, you studied with him, you knew him, you were a friend with him. Uh, and it does, it does make you very unique in that regard. There are others, of course, who have uh, as well. I could put that to, to them as well. But uh, what kind of a feeling comes over you personally when you think about that once in a while? There are very few of us who knew saints that well. Marvelous feeling of gratitude. When I think of Stanley Rother, I think always gratefully and grateful to God that I knew such a person and that he walked in the midst of all of us in this blessed, blessed and venerable seminary mm -hmm. which has um, sent forth so many in the United States filled with love of God, love of Jesus Christ and love for Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's quite a, if he came back here to his alma mater today, I wonder what he'd say to our fellows here. He probably would say... That's almost an unfair question. That's an unfair ask. question. But I hope he would say, be calm. It's The whole thing is in God's hands. Be kind. Mm -hmm. Be kind. Be kind. Very, very good. Well, on that wonderful note, let me just conclude this interview with you, if I may. This was a comment also made to Monsignor Mulcahy uh, by a priest in Oklahoma. I realize, he writes, it takes a certain intelligence to get along in the seminary. But I think that he, Father Rother, would make a very, very fine parish priest. He is determined to become one. I hope and pray he makes it. Thank you very much for your understanding in taking him I hope your efforts will not be in vain. I don't think there were any efforts in vain. No, Do you? not at all. And if you knew Monsignor Mulcahy as I knew him and worked with him, I was his vice rector, and he was my rector when I was a seminarian, and then was um, I was his vice rector when I was a priest. Um, he had the heart of a pastor. And I think he spotted in Stanley a pastor's heart. And Monsignor Mulcahy uh, would do anything in order to bring forth a pastor like that. Well, I, I think Monsignor Mulcahy is not the only one. You have a great pastoral heart yourself, and it comes across in this interview loud and clear. So thank you, Your Excellency, for giving us your time today. And the Mount will have this interview for many years to come, and, and uh, yeah, we'll be able to savor that friendship that you were lucky enough to have with Father Rother. Thank you so much, Father Connor. I'm very grateful to you. God bless you.